in your dynamics class, you certainly studied systems and a pen, I pulled out this example from Mary McCraig on pendulum. And in this, in this case, you know, you, in many dynamics problems, you might have looked for, uh, say, in this case, you're solving for the, uh, say, reaction forces at the pivot when the pendulum is at a certain angle. You then would find what is the acceleration, velocity at those points, so you can solve for forces. So that's, that's one way of using dynamic models. And um, again, that's different from the way we, the kind of models that we need. And uh, so I'm going to show you the type of model that we'll build in, in the next slide. This just continues that application. So you can look at it and remember, oh, yeah, I, I remember solving those kinds of problems. It brings back good memories. So here's this graph that you're becoming all too familiar with. And uh, this, is, this is what our goal is. You know, we've run some experiments. We've released the pendulum from rest. And we want to predict um, not only the accurately the frequency of oscillation right by virtue of the period between these points but also this this decay rate here later we're going to talk a little bit about how how to use those trends this is a linear trend to indicate what kind of friction is present in the system but we know that the kind of model that we need then is is one that can solve for these dynamics over time right so and that those are the ode the ordinary differential equations for uh, these systems that you're learning how to model in your dynamic systems and controls course. You know, in, in our introduction, we talked a little bit about uh, the uh, model for the simple pendulum, and, and it's worthwhile uh, starting here. Uh, you, I'm going to show you that modeling the compound pendulum, where we have mass distribution, right, on the pendulum, it's not just a uh, point mass at the end of a massless uh, um, support link L. Um, the compound pendulum is, is a simple extension of this. Again, remember this is a fixed axis rotation, so you have just rotation about that point, relatively simple model. And uh, we assume we have gravity acting down here, and um, we apply Newton's law uh, about that axis of rotation. And Newton's law um, or rotation is uh, says that the rate of change of angular momentum, dHT or h dot, um, is equal to j data double dot. Right, since h is equal to j omega, which is data dot, so you have j data double dot, and that's equal to the sum, uh, right, the net torques about uh, the, uh, that uh, point of rotation. In, in at least in this first uh, case, we're, we're going to assume that the only torque acting here, we assume there's no friction, the pivot, no resistance. So the only friction, as we saw before, is just this what we call this gravitational restoring torque. It's the uh, the torque due to the mass, and it tends to bring it uh, the pendulum to to rest at the vertical here. So again, g this is your basic equation: h dot equals sum of torques. That torque is just minus mgl sine theta. So you uh, uh, again, recognize here for the simple pendulum, the J is uh, just ML squared. So we end up with a nice simple nonlinear second order ODE as we've seen before. Okay. Compare that now uh, to the compound pendulum case. Again, J was just M ML squared. As you found in the first lab on compound pendulum, the J about the pivot, which I'm calling J sub 0 here, is just j plus m l c squared, where right l c is the uh, distance to the center of gravity. So you can see the equations end up very similarly. So uh, one of the things I'm asking you to do on uh, on the um, preparing for the lab is to review uh, and understand where this dynamic equation comes from. This is the model that we're going to be interested in. We're going to be adding other torques to this model. Remember, this the equation as it stands here only includes the inertia and that gravitational restoring torque. But you can see it's very similar to the simple pendulum. The only difference is this uh, is that is that this case here is for the rigid body case, right? The compound pendulum. Um, and you can see in some cases you might be able to approximate a compound pendulum with a simple pendulum. If if these terms here, if, if MLC over J naught was very much uh, approximately one over L C you could probably get away with not needing to know the environment of inertia. And uh, that would be uh, an interesting study to do in the lab is when, how, you know, when can you, can you tell when you could um, uh, approximate uh, 
a compound pendulum as a simple pendulum and it's really when you would have con more concentrated mass um, at, at, a, at a CG location. Now the, the real focus of the lab though is is um, the part that's kind of a little bit more difficult to determine. It's, it's not easy to assess what kind of friction we have here. We know it's there. So in addition to the, the, uh, to the gravitational torque, we want to introduce, and also in addition to understanding how to properly model inertial effects, which we've done in the first part of the, of the lab, is, is we want to try to incorporate torques uh, or the forces on the pendulum body. And the way we do that is just go back to your Newton's law equation, and you can see now you're just adding to that h dot the any other torques that might be present, right? So this remember this is just the sum of the net torques. This is still the gravitational torque. Now we've got an additional torque here due to friction. And let's say you had a motor at that pivot, that would be this other torque here. So you could add any other torques. We don't have any actuator in this case, and so really the only the the, the net torques on here are any. Uh, is the gravitational torque any any torques due to friction losses? Uh, we know that the pendulum system we've studied in the lab is not lost, so there has to be frictional torques there, and that's what we're going to try to model. So the two different types that we can look at, um, and remember these are models for what might be present in, at that pivot or acting on the overall pendulum system. One case is the viscous friction. This is sometimes the linear damping. Remember, we, we model all damping torques, frictional torques, as some torque for rotational systems as a function of the angular velocity omega, which is theta dot. So these two functions, one is the viscous friction or kind of a linear type friction. And we'll say T sub B here is some constant times omega, and this B uh, is a parameter that we don't know. Um, and we can't measure directly, we'll measure that indirectly, so to speak. And then also, um, we um, propose that there might also be some dry friction. You know, bearings, anytime you have sliding, a good model for that is, is actually the, friction, the, uh, the damping type torque or the friction torque is not increasing with velocity uh, the way a, a viscous or linear friction might work, right? As velocity increases, these kinds of frictional effects, dry friction, stays relatively constant. And that, actually, this is a non-linear type friction. This is a linear friction. And we want to see which one is dominant uh, in, in this system. Again, these are models just being used to represent combined processes that exist in the system. And we want to see which one's dominant. And, and we'll do that by looking at the measured data and tuning our model to see which one we might have. And it's difficult to separate them out and uh, measure them uh, in turn. So uh, we, we, we model them collectively and you know sort of tune it, uh, tune the model to see which one might be uh, dominant. Okay. So when we build our model, let's first look at case one, which is the compound pendulum only with the linear damping. So now I'm, note I'm only adding a T sub B here, which is that linear torque. When you do that, your second order equation Remember, it was the J theta double dot term, and then also the MGLC sine theta. So now you just added this B theta dot term. For small motion, remember, you could linearize this. You could say, oh, I'm going to assume that it moves very small. And that sine theta term, remember, would be approximately theta. And then this system, if it was only linear damping, would sort of behave like a linear second order differential equation. And it would have a closed form solution. We might look at some of these closed form solutions later in the course in other labs. You will certainly st be studying solutions of linear second order ODEs uh, in your dynamic systems and controls class, and that would be one way to solve for the small motion of this pendulum, right? Given that that's the only friction present. Um, in the second case, let's look at now adding an additional torque, which is due to this nonlinear friction. Now I just add another torque, call it T sub C for coulombic type friction. And note I'm using this little function here called a, sin a sinum function. And what it does is it it, it models that uh, constant torque due to kind of a dry friction. If this uh, sinum function is plus one if if A is greater than zero and negative one if it's less than zero. So the torque you see is some constant 
that we don't know. And again, it's hard to measure directly. Uh, if you had a very sensitive um, uh, like torque wrench, you could probably measure that. Um, but uh, we're going to measure that, again, as I said, indirectly through measured data. The problem with now introducing this nonlinear friction is now when you would include that in your overall model, this is a nonlinear function, so any closed form solutions uh, for the motion can't be found the way they are for, the, for that first case. And, and, in, and in particular, it's this, the, the fact that we likely have some drive friction and the need to model this kind of uh, uh, nonlinear friction torque is what motivates us to try to use a, a solution of, your, of these ODE equations using numerical integration techniques. In other words, to run some simulations. And, and that will now um, lead us to uh, talk a little bit about how we're going to do that.